I guess it's time for me then. Yes, it's time for you. Yeah. So we welcome you, Thomas Svensson from Thai Public. Uh, Thomas is going to drill into the most difficult part of identity that I have seen in my career. It's uh, privileged access management. And um, most companies think this is very difficult and Thomas is going to explain how Tychotic is helping them and um, I'm really looking forward to this because uh, I've struggled with this a lot and uh, if someone can solve this you'll make a lot of companies very happy I suppose. So the floor is to you uh, Stephen Swenson, Thomas Swenson. Um, I suppose we, we could raise a hand and put questions um, depending on the time uh, Thomas needs. Um, but um, I think it's, um, we could also save questions to the end. It's up to you, Thomas, uh, how to do that. Uh, um, I would prefer if we could do that in the end. Yeah. Um, so that we get the flow, uh, and a nice flow of the presentation. So, yeah. uh, but I'll, I'll be sure to, to, to leave some time for questions. Okay, well. Very good. So I'm going to share my go. screen. And I hope you all can see my screen now. Presentation. Yes, it's coming up. Yes, very good. I'm just gonna move into presentation mode. So, <clears throat> my name is uh, Thomas Ransson. I am the sales engineer for Thycotic in the Nordic region. Um, and I have to apologize in advance because I have a, a little bit of a hay fever going on, so my voice is kind of terrible at the moment, but uh, hopefully it won't crack too much during this presentation. Um, and Thycotic, just a few words on Thycotic. So we are uh, a vendor operating in the privileged, privileged access management space. Uh, we are an American company headquartered in Washington, D.C. And uh, we are considered to be a leader by the major uh, resource uh, research institutes. Uh, I don't know if you might care or you might not care about this, but for us, it actually tells us that we are doing something right. We are moving in the right direction and we are relevant to our customers in the PAM space. We have uh, roughly 13,000 customers globally, ranging from small small companies to very large enterprises, so all over the place. And today, <clears throat> we're going to talk about um, the kitchen table admin, because that's what most of us have become during the pandemic. We work from home, which of course, in some cases, is quite nice, but it also introduces a lot of risk uh, to, to organizations, um, because most of us simply don't have uh, enterprise security tools at home. And we are basically moving the company perimeter to our home offices. <clears throat> That's one of the uh, challenges. There are, there are quite a few. Another one might be that it might be hard to actually facilitate the remote workers' uh, access to applications and tools the way you would do uh, if they were uh, sitting in the office. Uh, you might do some temper, temporary access uh, methods. Maybe you cannot uh, have all your authentication mechanisms on, um, etc. There are just um, there are a number of challenges with with this, and this number is probably not news to anyone. Eighty-five percent of cyber attacks um, start with a compromised endpoint. Well, it has to start somewhere. <laughs> it's usually on the endpoint. Um, and this number has been around almost forever. So the question is, can we do something about this? Because we, we want to reduce this number greatly. Because this, is, this is a scary number. And this is also why Gartner several years has, has said that PAM should be uh, a priority one to every CISO uh, on the CISO's priority list. Uh, and that's the reason for that, because it's simply will give you the most bang for the buck, so to say, because we're taking care of the uh, root problem of many of the breaches. And that is, uh, we need to deny, we cannot, re 
there are a lot of good uh, security, cybersecurity tools out there. Uh, but what we really can do is that we can actually deny attackers access to your privileged accounts, even if they are able to breach your defenses. This is the most important thing, because if they cannot get to your privileged accounts, they cannot really move laterally within your uh, organization. So this is like the, um, the basics of what we do. And PAM, PAM is not privileged access management. It's, it's not a single technology. It's not a silver bullet. It's actually, it's, it's a concept. So I'm going to focus more on the endpoint side here today in this um, meeting. So, because we want to address the problem of local admins. Because, let's face it, we have privileged accounts everywhere. We cannot really do anything on our machines without privileged accounts. So, on one hand, we need them. On the other hand, it's, uh, it's something that is very dangerous. If the wrong um, person gets hold of these uh, credentials, um, they can do a lot of harm to your organization. So, um, and, and this kind of problem has been around really forever because it's really hard to do anything about this. Just removing local admins, um, that will uh, give a lot of other headaches um, that we need to be able to address. But, um, I mean, we can even see that even Microsoft doesn't think it's a good idea to, to have local uh, admins on your machines. Because, I mean, vulnerabilities and, and bugs. Bugs exist in every software, in all software. As long as we have humans developing software, we will have bugs that will result in vulnerabilities. The, the main thing is that uh, how can we prevent someone from exploiting those uh, vulnerabilities? And of course, a part of that is to make sure that you don't have over permissive users on your machines that could take advantage of this. Because if you're if your users are over permissive, that will open them up to all kinds of different attacks. Uh, they will be very, very vulnerable, which actually means that your organization is vulnerable. So we already spoke about um, that it's probably not a good idea to have um, local administrators on your uh, user machines, because basically your users become God. And as God, you can do anything. Uh, you can connect to other machines uh, and do whatever you like, basically. So, um, and also malicious software that might find the, the way into your machines, of course, will take make use of this, uh, using your pri privileges to do harm. But, okay, so let's remove the local admin rights stuff. Let's do it. Well, this is normally not a good idea. and. Many organizations that have already done this or tried this find themselves in some problems because what this actually means in uh, the uh, example of, for instance, Windows environments, you will not be able to do anything almost anymore, which will uh, severely decrease productivity of users because all of a sudden they cannot install applications anymore. They can't even change settings of their own machines. So what do they do then? Well, they will for sure contact support. So support will very likely be overloaded with support requests because they have to help every user that has this problem. I cannot run this app. I cannot change this and that. And with time, if you're a bigger organization, uh, everything will just queue up, which means that you will have a lot of users just sitting around and can do really nothing. So this is what we need to address. So how do we do this then? How do we get to a state where we can actually remove local admins without impacting our users' productivity and increasing your security posture? So we have, part of our solution is called Privilege Manager. This is uh, a product that is actually addressing this problem. Um, it's an agent-based solution, and it works on Windows computers, uh, Linux and Max. And uh, just to summarize this, we it's agent based, uh, and the idea here is to remove your your local admins. But before doing that, we need to understand what applications are running on your endpoint. And um, 
the way we actually do that. So the end goal is to remove your local admins and instead we'll elevate applications for your users because there's a big difference in those two words. Because if you are elevated as a user, you can do whatever you like in the machine normally. Um, if we instead elevate an application for you without you even having to be an administrator, we just elevate the application that you need run to run right now. That's a big difference. And that's really what um, what privilege manager do. So if we do our job correctly, your users shouldn't even notice that they don't have local admin permissions anymore. They should just be able to do their work as they normally do. So um, if we go into the kind of use cases or challenges we get from, from prospects and customers. So, I mean, this is a very normal thing to ask. So we actually don't know what's running on our endpoints. So how can you, how can you really? So this is something we need to start here. We need to figure out what is running on your endpoints. So what we normally do is that we actually, um, the agents are uh, put in learning mode uh, and we listen, listen only. We want to disturb your users, users at all. We will just understand what, what is running on the endpoints. And uh, when we do that, after a while, all the agents will send their findings to the management interface. And now we have some interesting data to work with because now we have found applications. Um, and we have a lot of information to work with. So we know what application has been run by which users on what computers. And now when we have this information, we can start creating policies. And um, so, and the policies, they can be uh, created in many different ways. But what we do when we identify an application, we will extract metadata from that application that you can work with to create your policies. It could be many things. Like we, if we find that a certain application has been signed by uh, a certificate signer, we can use that. Uh, to identify a certain application. We can use file names, of course, file hashes, um, and things like that. So now we have started to understand what apps are actually running on your um, machines, and we have slowly started to create the policies to handle those uh, uh, applications. So at this point, we're not doing anything. We're not enforcing anything still. We're just listening. But then also, of course, this is probably one of the most important things, you know, our users need to run applications, uh, which would need admin privileges. How do we know what applications require elevation, for instance? Well, this is something that um, the agent will find out, which will understand if an application requires uh, to be elevated to run. Um, and also this is, um, so now we're getting into, okay, so now we need to start creating policies um, to control what applications to elevate. Uh, we can even work with de-elevating some applications. They might, uh, so, so that is also something we can do. We can actually give them, they might want too much. So we, can, we can kind of reduce the elevation possibilities of applications as well. Um, and when we create this kind of elevation, uh, policies. Um, there are different uh, steps here. So, for instance, if we're talking about the kind of uh, normal uh, low risk stuff that's going on because users might want to install printers, they might want to be able to change date and time and things like that. Well, we don't want to disturb users for that. So, we'll just silently elevate those kind of applications because we already know we need elevation. So we can just uh, create those, the bulk of applications, we can just silently elevate. Now we can also work with, uh, <clears throat> for instance, if you have a, a trusted file share that you have all your installers that you would like your users to install, you only allow your users to install applications from this trusted file share. You can do that. And we can also integrate with, for instance, SSCM. Windows, so your deployment systems, so that if you have your, for instance, uh, you can basically kind of whitelist or allow list all the applications that are pushed from uh, SSCM to your, your clients. 
can even work with um, elevating applications that you have in a golden image. And just to trust some applications. So, so if this application A needs to uh, auto update, well, it should be able to do that uh, uh, automatically because we trust this application because it's signed by Microsoft or whatever. And again, <clears throat> the users should not notice anything. It should be business as usual to them. So there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes, but the users are not aware of them yet. This is, um, you know, what about all the un unknowns? Because very few environments are static. Your users will introduce new applications all the time. So how do you want to handle those? This is a very important topic because um, there might be a lot of analytics uh, going on because you have some applications that you want to allow today. Um, your security department has done some analytics, due diligence on those applications. You're fine with those. But what about the new ones that are constantly introduced to your to your organization? Um, we need to be, be able to handle them as well, of course. So this is where we would suggest that we enable workflows. So for instance, we have a what we call a catch-all rule or several catch-all rules that uh, the privilege manager rule set is built almost like a firewall rule set. So all the applications that are flowing through the whole rule set without getting a hit means that there is no rule for this uh, specific app. It will be uh, catched by a catch-all rule for unknown applications. This is an unknown application. What do you want to do with this? We suggest that you enable a, what we call a request for access workflow on this application. So, which basically means that a user that is trying to run a new application will be presented with a window where he or she needs to enter a justification. So, why does this person need to run this application? And then someone in the um, uh, in the privilege man manager uh, administrations group need or help desk actually and need to approve this or reject based on the justification and when they do this they have two choices basically they have three choices they could um, approve this for one-time use as, as long for the remainder of the session when you're using this uh, application or you could do say that okay so i'm approving this application you can use it for four days or four hours uh, or you can simply deny it and or you can simply quarantine this new application um i want to be 100 percent sure i just want to quarantine it directly so you can't use it until we have uh, analyzed the application or you can allow the application to run in uh, some kind of a sandbox so we basically really restrict the environment that is running in so that it is if it is something uh, malicious in that um, application it cannot get to your machine uh, we can also, as an added uh, security, we could, for instance, integrate with uh, reputation tools like Virus Total, which means that at execution time, we are sending an API call to uh, Virus Total to ask for their verdict on this specific application. And if Virus Total deems it bad, then we will block it. So this is an extra layer of protection. And um, as I kind of mentioned, just so you can delegate the approval. Usually, organizations tend to put the approval part with help because they sit in the middle of the organization. So they they usually get this delegated to them. And if you're using some kind of ticketing system like ServiceNow, um, you can work with that. So uh, approvals can be approved or rejected from ServiceNow. That's your system of choice. And this is just um, to show you uh, some of the kind of windows that we use to how we communicate with your users. So um, I was talking about the request for access workflow that would be the one to the left, where a user will be uh, presented with this kind of window where he or she has to enter a justification. This window can of course be branded with your logo. Um, and you can also uh, make sure that you link to your corporate policy to educate your users. Maybe they have forgotten about you know, the 
the, the, the policies of your uh, organization, so you can give them an easy access to that policy, so they can refresh their uh, the knowledge. So, um, but nevertheless, uh, the one to, to the left, that that window uh, justification needed and sent off to, for instance, help desk and um, also the application notice uh, to the right. This is used mainly for um, an example would be a trusted user because the whole idea with privilege manager is that based on you, who you are as a user, uh, I might be a developer, for instance. I need to run PowerShell and I'm a trusted user, but we still want to know why you, I need to run PowerShell as an administrator because that's a powerful thing to do. So basically this is, we just want something in our audit logs here. So we're not asking me to do the full request for the application itself, because it's already accepted for, for use. I mean, uh, every time I try to run it as an admin, uh, we want to know why, just for the audit logs. And when I have typed something in there, uh, I will be able to run PowerShell. But this is also one of the most interesting, I, I think it's, it's the most easiest way to explain what Privilege Manager uh, is mostly about. So if we take the PowerShell example, because PowerShell is a very powerful application. It uh, really can do a lot, especially for sysadmins. It can also be a very dangerous application in the, in the wrong hand. So that's why we can actually give access, different kind of access to PowerShell, depending who, on who you are as a user. So if you belong to the sysadmins group in Active Directory or the developers group, we might give you, we might just want to silent to elevate PowerShell for you. But if another user that just found PowerShell and wanted to play around with it is trying to run with as an administrator, that person will be faced with a request for access workflow because we don't want that to happen just like that. So that we get full control of your application. And this is just an example. This can be done with all applications almost in your, in your environment. And the last one is, of course, an application denied uh, message, which your users will be presented with if they try to run a uh, blocked application. And this is also good for troubleshooting purposes because you have the, some good information in there, what application it is and what user uh, was trying to run that. Great for troubleshooting as well. So this is just um, some to show that we are actively communicating with your users. And this is to tie back to the unknown application um, policies I was talking about a while ago. So this is kind of to visualize a workflow for, for um, uh, unknown applications. So in this case, it is actually a user running um, an application for the first time that we, we don't know about this uh, application yet. And there is um, a workflow enabled on a policy that is actually uh, forcing the user to do a justification for this application. That request will end up with help desk that can either approve this for one-time use or, okay, you're, you can use it for the, the remainder of the day, but then you need to do the same thing again. After this has been done, now we know about this application. Um, this, this user might really have a need for this application. It, it's super important that he or she can run it. So, okay, we'll, we'll approve it for one-time use. The same hand, the uh, Privilege Manager Administration team, they're constantly looking through the logs and see, checking the new findings of, of, of uh, Privilege Manager. Um, so, they will start analyzing this application now. And understand, get an understanding. Okay, is this something that we need in our in our organization? Should it be allowed or should it be blocked? How do I want to treat this specific application? So now they will actually move this uh, application either to a deny policy or to another policy further up in the uh, rule set. This is very similar to working with an application-based firewall. The approach is the same. Basically. You need a cache all rule in the beginning to understand, to get out all the unknowns, and they will become knowns as soon as someone runs them for the first time. And then you know about it and can do something about it. So this is, and then 
the whole circle kind of repeats itself because as all security products, it's not a fire and forget product. It needs it needs uh, constant improving, in, improving and tweaking, of course, um, so that you know that you have the best rules uh, in your organization. Because now we are, and if you've done everything correctly now, now we start. Now we can remove local admins, and we can do that directly from uh, uh, Privilege Manager. Now you're ready to to do that, and when you do that, we ha have actually ensured that it will be business as usual for your users. Um, while behind the scenes, you have just made a huge improvement to your security posture. You don't have any local admins anymore um, on your endpoints. So this, our goal is of course on a security scale, we start off with nothing. And uh, as we have uh, said it before here, um, the problem today is that most users simply do have to uh, are over permissive and that opens up a lot of risk and cybersecurity is all about managing risk. But again, with all security products, it's a fine balance between usability and security. So we don't want to be too strict and we don't want to be too loose. So what we have done with Privilege Manager is that we have uh, developed uh, a framework, a policy framework to actually help you um, to deploy the solution quicker. Um, and this policy framework is based on real life experience because we have quite a few customers on this platform already. So, um, and this is just to aid you basically. So to, to be, um, so that you can be in compliance. Um, and you will be much more secure than you were before. Uh, but the admin um, efforts to get to that point will be greatly reduced because we will supply you with a, a great number of policies already uh, pre-configured in the solution that will greatly reduce the uh, time to deploy time or actually time to go live time. Again, this needs to be maintained because uh, new as we said before new applications are introduced all the time so this is a continuous cycle um, but we will give you the tools that you need to have visibility this will help you in audits of course uh, but great visibility and full control of your endpoints so i don't know some of you might be new to um, to this kind of technology. If you are, we have some uh, resources on our public website. Where you can find out more. For instance, we have a least privileged cybersecurity for dummies uh, and much more, of course. So I think with that, are there any questions? <clears throat> Anyone, any questions? Please go ahead. Easy ones are very welcome. Okay, well, I do have some questions. Uh, let me summarize what I just think I learned from you, that mm -hmm. uh, there is, um, well, of course, we all know about privileged access control, that it's not easy, uh, first of all, to know where your vulnerable and local admins are, uh, which, they, and I think you define the privileged um, access uh, mm -hmm. admin or access management, as going as a topic that addresses the admin uh, accounts only is that correct it's merely that, that, about local or in general admin accounts yes. or highly yes. elevated authorizations that's that's correct yes and then i see that um, if i summarize it there are uh, methods to find out where these accounts reside and if they are um, yeah you will probably already have a list defined which are the most vulnerable ones, uh, vulnerable technologies and areas. If we look at the Microsoft uh, uh, um, Active Directory domain, for instance, you, you probably have some domains where you look first, you find out where these uh, uh, access um, authorizations um, yes. reside, and then, instead of leaving them with the local user, 
you, re, uh, you remove them from the local user and the local devices, but yeah. you bring them to uh, an agent that does it for them. And you do that by inserting policies and um, enforcing access control through that agent. Yes. And instead of um, just the, as, as we used to do it, uh, most of the time, access management is also about access governance, where there's a whole process of requesting and receiving access on a certain uh, entitlement. And this is also a bit mixed, I think, the access governance and the access enforcement, the technical enforcement that someone can't get the access next to the rights, whether someone should have these access uh, uh, levels. Is that correct? That is correct. But it's also, uh, and as I said before, you know, th this privilege manager is a component of privilege access management. Uh, just to illustrate that, I, mm -hmm. I put a, a slide up there um, because this really addresses the least, priv addresses least privilege for your yeah. endpoints. Uh, uh, also, uh, from our side, Secret Server, that um, also they, Secret Server and Privilege Manager go kind of hand in hand. So Privilege Manager addresses the least privilege problem on the endpoint, while Secret Server uh, takes care of that, of your identities, you know, like in, in Active Directory or uh, databases or privileged accounts that exist everywhere. Uh, on the endpoint though, um, something will need to be there uh, as an agent to really, because it's very important to address the local admin problem on, on endpoints because that's where the problem should start. We could see that 85% of all the breaches yeah. are successful because there are too many uh, admins around, so on, on endpoints. So by by doing that, so, uh, and this is a broad topic. It's a very broad topic, Pam. Uh, but uh, today I was just focusing on a small part and that was the endpoint part of it. Yeah, I see. Because uh, in my uh, experience, I know that Often in a company, the governance, who owns what, who is accountable for what security mm. part is not easy because large corporations, as I know them, they tend to make a division uh, across the application owners, people who yeah. own the application, that's often a different department. And then there is the infrastructure part, which is often managed by a different department. And even often it is outsourced. So it means those are people who have local admin rights or even rights on servers and infrastructure. They are not even employees of their own company because it's outsourced and it's very complex to do that. Is that something you are looking at as well? Do you have yeah. some advice there too? Yeah, so so uh, um, that's why you know a very important part of this is of course uh, not just the technic uh, technical part, it's about people and processes and exactly what you said. You you see that in in, in large corporations, uh, normally the same kind of challenges. Um, this is also you know to be able to handle this. One part of this is of course processes, but it's also part of you know role based access. So you can divide different kind of responsibilities. You, you often have a lot of different departments um, that needs to be a part. All of your organization needs to be a part of PAM, of course. Everyone needs to use it because otherwise you haven't really won anything with the solution. So that's why it's very important to have role-based uh, administration capabilities to let the relevant groups in to the solution, um, but only allow them to do what they're supposed to do to do their job, so to say, and nothing more. So least privilege is key here. And uh, this is something that we can address with our products. So the outsourcing challenge can also be handled. Uh, we have handled it many times. Um, it's, it's, it's a complex topic sometimes, but normally it's, it's um, sometimes you can retrofit a PAM solution to your uh, environment, but Usually, if you try to do that 100%, you will you will not be very successful because it usually involves some changes in processes to be able to use this solution that will bring you so much security-wise in an effective way. You need to change some processes internally. Yeah. Uh, another question that's relating to this is that 
um, often such outsourced companies who run someone's infrastructure, they already have often, they often have their own solutions as well, and those may not be the same. Uh, they might may not all work with Phycotic. Uh, is it is there an option to have interoperability with other PAM solutions, or uh, to have some connectivity or at least exchange uh, this? Because yes. um, if 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 IBM runs my infrastructure and they use CyberArk, for instance, uh, and still there should be some exchange. How do you look at that? Yeah. So Phycotic. Uh, most of our products have APIs, REST APIs, mm -hmm. which of course uh, is a benefit if you want to integrate with other products. So that that is definitely uh, we have done it. Uh, won't name any vendors, but it, it is totally possible to do it, and it's, sometimes you need to do it. Yeah. So so we, we give you an extensive tool toolbox uh, to integrate with with other with third party solutions. Okay. Yeah. That's, I think that's an important one. Yeah. Uh, and do you have any future vision on um, how to manage this um, the problem? Or yeah, I think it's a problem of DevOps where you have the borderline across applications and infrastructure um, blurring because you have applications that can do automated deployment of applications. Uh, where this is all server to server or application to server communication where there are no human uh, interactions uh, required or uh, where we're not talking about real employees uh, having access but uh, yeah. a whole machinery of um, um, yeah stuff uh, operating on each other. How Do you have any future vision on developing something for that or is that already possible? That is already there. So uh, this is something that we can um, handle with, for instance, Secret Server, because a good PAM solution should be able to <clears throat> handle both human identities mm -hmm. as well as non-human identities. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what you described now. That is a use case that we see more and more because of DevOps teams and automation. Yeah. Uh, so this is something we can, um, we have built in support for that, the Secret Server. And that is, of course, through APIs. So a very uh, common use case is that you have these automation. I mean, it could be anything. Might, you might have orchestration tools. Um, you have a fully automated solution. Um, you have a DevOps uh, environment with a lot of tools that need to access um, other applications or tools. You don't want those um, credentials hard-coded into your applications or mm -hmm. script files. That's where uh, our central vault comes into play because we can offload those credentials into the password vault and instruct the applications to go fetch the credentials in our secure encrypted password vault instead. They will do that programmatically. And we actually have a specialized product for DevOps. Uh, it's built to scale enormously. It's called DevOps Secrets Vault. And it's, it's just doing this basically. It can integrate with huge uh, DevOps pipelines to deliver this kind of functionality. Or you can do it with Secret Server as well. So yeah, we have those capabilities already. Yeah. So you work both with the um, authorization management of the yeah. high-level authorizations yes. Yes. and also the credentials to enforce this access. Or uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. Because yeah. even if it's I'm yeah. sorry, so no, even that's... even if it's an application account that accesses a secret programmatically, it's still important to have role-based access in place, right? Because yeah. Just because it's a machine, you cannot trust it. <laughs> so uh, you shouldn't trust it. You have to put the same boundaries on that machine as you do with your use. You can enforce role-based admin on, on machines as well. Oh, that sounds really nice. One more question from my side, and maybe some someone has already thought about new questions. How do you know that the findings when you are uh, analyzing the environment to find the privileged access, how do you know that you are complete in your findings? Uh, you mean on the application level? Yes. Yeah. Um, so that we do that with, um, yeah. Uh, there's very few false positives, to be honest, because we are basically, when we see an application, 
um, we will analyze it and we will find out, for instance, that it's uh, Google Chrome. Uh, I haven't heard of any false positives so far. Okay. Um, so it's there is no magic going on here. We're basically um, taking an application, extracting metadata from it to understand this is an application. This is application A, uh, and uh, so that's basically how we do it. Yeah. So, so if I have my complete list in my CMDB, my configuration management database, if I have a complete list of applications and infrastructure, and I am sure that uh, the tool can access it then I will be complete. Yeah. And I also, will have all these thousands of entitlements uh, addressed. Yes. And, and also as this extra security layer that you can actually integrate us with, for instance, virus total, um, to just have that as an extra layer of protection so that you're sure that, because virus total will for sure tell you if this, this application is not good. It's, it's doing stuff that is not good. Uh, it might not be a malware, but it might be a, a bad application. It will tell you. And it's up to you what you want to do with that information. Maybe you just want to log it and, and alert your admins about it, or you can be really restrictive and say that, hey, I trust Virus Total fully. If they think it's bad, I do as well. Even if you actually allow this application in your, uh, um, in your policy sets, Virus Total will take ownership of that, so to say. So that's one way of doing it as well, because one application might be good at first glance, but while after virus total analyzed it, we might get other information. So let's treat it uh, based on that, what virus total thinks. That's a good way of doing it, I think. Okay, um, well then it is, in the meantime, uh, someone else may have uh, found out about in more questions, so uh, feel free to take the floor. I have a question, so, so this solution is um, addressing the needs for when you have an employee or another resource where you actually control the, the machine. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a case where you have a, a contractor or a business partner or similar that needs access to your systems, but mm. where you don't have control of the endpoint, mm. how do you handle that use case? So, <clears throat> so privilege manager will not be uh, very useful for you there for your contractors if they if they don't allow you to install this agent on their machines. Um, I know some some. Some customers handle that challenge by actually providing their uh, contractors with machines that are pre-configured by them. If you don't want to do that, well, then there another option might be to actually use Secret Server. Um, that won't really take care of the local admin problems on your machine. But what you can do, I mean, since Secret Server is privileged access management a portal where you will actually log on to um, to get access to some privileged accounts that you need maybe you need to connect your contractor need to connect to like a, a, I don't know, a windows server or something you will log on to the system uh, with credentials as well as he needs to pass two-factor authentication and then he can get to see the privileged accounts that he is supposed to be using and then we can allow that user can actually do session management as well. So we can launch an RDP launcher, for instance, to your target machine, and we can record what's going on on screen uh, while the person is working on that machine. And if we see something that we don't like, we can actually kill the session, and we can even record keystrokes um, in, in, in that session recording. So that's like a workaround that, that, that could work, but it doesn't, if you can't install the agent, you cannot uh, remove the um, local admin uh, problem, so to say. I don't know, if, I hope that made sense. Thank you. Thanks. Any more people who want to add something to the discussion? Nobody. Um, well, I think this is a very interesting and also very complex topic. Uh, I would really like to see, uh, I'm, I'm getting really curious to see some architecture picture 
where we look at zero trust architecture with uh, other um, controls as well, uh, where this product is sitting uh, integrated and how that would look like, but that would probably be a real uh, real time um, use case implementation. But maybe a reference architecture on how all the other um, regular topics or regular elements in a company architecture, how that would look like with the zero trust um, yeah. um, right. picture, how that would look like some some yeah some some visual that that would be really thinking. I think that would really add a lot to the understanding and uh, yeah. to the view. Yeah, um, it, it, I appreciate it. it, it it might be a little bit confusing because there are many products. Uh, who's doing what? What do we really address with that with product X and so on? Exactly. What to address with what product? Um, mm. Because uh, other vendors also tend to become more sweet, like instead of an application, a single application, but more a suite of functionalities. Yeah. Um, and also uh, infrastructure vendors start to add on that type of, uh, especially when we talk about cloud, there's a lot already there as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, from my perspective, I think that I would have a lot more questions uh, um, yes. um, to get the vision correct. Um, yes. Is there anyone, anything you still want to, uh, as a, your most uh, important one-liner you want to share with us? I mean, the, the, the <laughs> uh, you have my contact details here. Uh, yeah. Feel free to contact me. I think it's... Uh, be the best way because um, when it comes to privileged access management, whatever your pain points might be, and I appreciate that this is kind of a complicated matter because there are quite a few products, I'll be happy to kind of make this less confusing uh, if I understand your your use cases and uh, we can usually solve them, uh, to be honest. So uh, feel free to contact me at any time. You have my email address here on screen and uh, you will be supplied with this um, with the slide deck as well. Uh, after the meeting, so just feel free to contact me if you have any more questions. Well, thank you very much for being part of this uh, uh, lunch break. Uh, I see that some people have already needed to leave us. Um, well, once again, this whole session has been recorded. The link will be made available. Um, the participants have also got the presentation as a PDF document, and if not, they will still get it. Um, well, this is Jacoba Cedars here uh, from Identity Next, um, being your host. Uh, feel free to uh, connect to Thomas or to Identity Next, and really welcome to one of our next sessions, 17th of June. It's the next one where Rabobank will show its vision about um, trust services, which uh, trust is the basis for collaboration. And uh, the 4th of September, we have an open space. Uh, we will soon come up with a name and, and uh, title for that presentation. In October 11 and 12, Identity Matters, and that's uh, our own identity annual event. We'll dry, uh, dry, drill deeper into why identity is such an important topic and also about uh, identity being the real new parameter. We get location less, uh, location independent, but identity is all the more important, especially after COVID and during COVID. Uh, 18th of November is the next date. And then the 7th of December, we have a physical meetup. I hope that everyone and everything is a bit back to normal by that time. Thank you very much, Thomas, for being part of uh, this uh, lunch break. Thank and all much. the participants also, um, well, very nice that you were here. And I hope uh, together we can um, bring the knowledge on identity and uh, interesting topics, uh, spread the knowledge uh, by coming together in these type of uh, activities. For Thank sure. You. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.